our first Democratic presidential candidate, Andrew Yang. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. It's fantastic wow. to be here. Thank you all. First ever. <laughs> Doctor, good to see you. I'm over there. <laughs> You're Excellent. right here. It says candidate in the middle. Yes. Please. I can read. <sighs> nice leather white seats. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, for each candidate, we're going to spend some time to get to know them. Then we'll get into issues. Uh, and then after that, if we have time, we're going to go out and talk to you for a little bit. And you might even see the candidate face to face. And then they're going to close uh, with a message for all of you. So that's what we're roughly going to try to do along the way. Does that sound good? All right. They're not so excited about that format. I, know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I, I love it. Andrew, uh, where are you from? Oh, my parents met as graduate students at UC Berkeley. Any bears here in the Woo! audience? <laughs> to be it. Uh, so they met as graduate students. They wanted to stay here in California, but my dad ended up getting a job at uh, GE in Schenectady. So I was born in upstate New York. Yeah. Then uh, I grew up in upstate New York. I went to school in New England, uh, and I've been working in startups for about 20 years. And then eight years ago, I started a nonprofit called Venture for America yeah. that ended up taking me all over the country. No, but where are you really from? <laughs> Indeed. No. Where are you really from? <laughs> He's going to keep going with this. <laughs> Come on, Andrew. I'll you say New York would be what I'd go with someone. Yeah. No. I did want to ask, because I hear a lot of your Yang Gang right here in the audience, but I kind of wanted to go back to the original Yang Gang, uh, the family of four that you guys have, um, and just kind of... Go back to pre-campaign Andrew Yang, that got sleep, that woke up, had breakfast. I remember those things. Yeah. Uh, what? Let's go back to that time. Uh, I, I'd say the biggest uh, real pivot for me was when I, I left my business to start Venture for America. Uh, so I was in some ways prepared to run for president because I'd been running a national nonprofit for seven years. and that set of activities is actually not that dissimilar from, uh, from being a candidate. But I just want to emphasize how much like I, uh, how much we all have in common, where my parents just said, do well in school, get good grades, get a good job, and I, I tried to listen. Uh, and then uh, I, I was an unhappy lawyer for five months. Um, sorry, lawyers. <laughs> God. I'm sure there's some of you here. <laughs> Maybe one or two. Uh, and then uh, I left to start a business that, that did not work out. And then I worked in startups for a period of time. So this is not that unusual, I think. Like, you all had know many people in our community that resemble that. Uh, after my company was acquired in 2009, I became very sad about what was going on in, in much of the country, where I felt like the financial crisis had, to me, made very clear that we had too much talent heading to Wall Street and management consulting firms and becoming corporate lawyers. And so I started this nonprofit to help train entrepreneurs in places like Detroit, Cleveland, Baltimore, St. Louis. So, so that was really like the, the, the major divergence, I would say, from, uh, from what you'd consider like a fairly normal entrepreneurial career. Uh, and so when you ask what my life was like pre-running for president, it, it's really more what it was like pre-running for Venture for America. And that when you start traveling this country, uh, at least for me, I had never been to St. Louis or Birmingham. Uh, or Cleveland or New Orleans, and I was staggered by the the gulf between those parts of the country and, frankly, places like this one um, or where I'd, I'd grown up. Uh, and so during that time, I came to realize that our country is in much worse shape than I certainly I thought. And then when Donald Trump won in 2016, um, I thought that, for whatever reason, immigrants were being scapegoated for issues that immigrants had nothing to do with, and that it's not immigrants, it's the fact that Technology has advanced to a point where many, many Americans are struggling to get by. Mm -hmm. And that first initial moment when you told your wife that you were going to run, where, where, where were you in the kitchen? Were you kind of just 
you know, just, you know, it, I want to be just, president, you know? Yeah. Uh, what's funny is that we actually talk about this now and we laugh about it because we had this conversation, but she's like, I genuinely do not remember the conversation or, was it or my after reaction. after the Rice Krispies, after the first cup of coffee? Oh, by the way, honey, I'm considering this. Oh, what I, I said to her, I said, hey, baby, I'm going to have lunch with this guy, Andy Stern, and if he comes back and tells me that no one else is going to run for president on the fact that automation is uh, displacing all these American workers, then I'm going to end up doing it. And she said, okay, well, you know, let me know how that goes. <laughs> I, I, I came back. She, uh, she quickly drove to church uh, and was praying. <laughs> exactly. All right. and, Andrew, let's talk about your most important contribution to the world so far, your lack of a tie. I think you've liberated me from doing that. Yes. And, uh, you know, when, when JFK became president, he didn't wear a hat. That liberated American men from wearing hats. So we will see a sartorial shift because of you. But um, we have some, a little bit in common. You're the son of Taiwanese immigrants, is that right? Yes. I'm the son of Vietnamese refugees. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of children of refugees and immigrants in the audience today, and my refugee background had a huge impact on my life. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to be a child of Taiwanese immigrants? Well, I think that many people here in the audience, and I'm sure you, Viet, uh, can relate to many of the experiences where you grow up, your parents are immigrants, and so you feel like your spot in this country is somewhat in question. At least that's the way I felt growing up. And when I grew up, I'm 44 now, so there are only three TV networks, and they added the fourth and whatnot. So there are only a few channels to watch. Uh, and American culture was fairly well-defined, I think, at that time. So we, my brother and I uh, tried to fit in, really, and failed a lot of the time, I would say. Uh, you know, I went to Chinese school on weekends. I was a very nerdy. Chinese kid uh, played piano and had braces and had really big glasses because they hadn't invented thin glasses yet. <laughs> I didn't, whoever invented those did us all a favor. Uh, but my parents said, look, you know, just work hard. Uh, and certainly to the theme of today's event, there was never a message about politics. There was never, you know, run for office or any of that. It was keep your head down, study hard, uh, do well in school. I was one of the only Asian kids in my town, and so uh, that made me feel like I had to sort of prove myself a lot. Um, I got, I guess you'd call it bullied now uh, a fair amount. Uh, got called chink and gook and things like that fairly regularly. And uh, I felt like I had a choice at that time to either take it or fight, um, and so I decided to fight. And uh, I w I'd skipped a grade, and I was very skinny, so I would lose most all of those fights. Mm -hmm. uh, that gives you a sense of, of you know, the arc. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when you get older, too, like I ended up going to um, Exeter and Brown, and there was a period during which uh, spending time with other Asian Americans was like a real relief. Uh, and I also went to these nerd camps during the summer where there were lots of Asians. Shocking. shocking. Uh, and, and so, like, that there was this period during my adolescence where it felt like there was almost, like, my town and the school district, which was uh, almost entirely white. And then I'd have summers or other environments where I'd spend more time with more uh, people who are Asian American. Well, you know, um, part of what you're sketching out is the background that I think a lot of us are familiar with. You know, we as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are expected to succeed, and you have all the credentials that you're supposed to have. So stereotypically, we seem to fit well into this idea of a meritocratic society. And yet, I think your idea of universal basic income implies that there's some problems with a meritocratic society that's built on winners and losers, and the people who lose are the ones to blame, not the system itself. I mean, do you agree with that assessment? Is meritocracy something that is a, as American as apple pie, or should, be worried, should we be worried about that impact on people? Well, first, I, I get mistaken for a West Coast Asian an awful lot, which I take as a real compliment, because I feel like all the cool Asians are West Coast Asians. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. It's true. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Uh, and, and the cool Asians are West Coast Asians in part because they're, you know, like, I think the kids who grow up here um, don't have the, the same uh, isolation or marginalization that my brother and I grew up where, you know, it's, instead of a town where it's literally like 1% or 2% Asian, which was my experience, it might be like 20 or 40 or 50 or something along those lines. Um, and despite the fact that I was very good at, s at filling out Scantron sheets and, and uh, bubble cards and whatnot, I, I, I do think that the American meritocracy has serious problems, uh, and right now that it's being sold to people, oversold 
uh, actually, and it's being used as a, a means to uh, keep things essentially the way they are and have privilege just get passed from, uh, you know, within uh, families and within communities at this point. There needs to be a fundamental questioning, in part because if you, I was a corporate attorney for five months, which is long enough to know that you can automate that job now. <laughs> uh, like, if you have software that can do the job of many workers, it's independent of your merit. You know, like, if, if you have artificial intelligence that can read a, a radiology film more accurately than any human radiologist, it's not that the radiologist was lazy or isn't trying hard, it's just the software can reference more data points and can see shades of gray that the human eye cannot. So if we cling too long to the fact that it's like, oh, you get what you deserve, even when that stops making sense, uh, then it's going to set this country up for a very difficult time. Since we're talking about UBI, and I know you're going to get there, and maybe bring it up once or twice or three or four or five times during our conversation, I'm very interested in what is the intermediate step to get that, I'm going to give you $1,000. You don't turn on a switch, as you know, and that happens. What's the intermediate step? You're not going to believe this, but in the 1960s, this was so mainstream that the U.S. government just started giving thousands of families thousands of dollars just to see what would happen. Uh, I know that sounds far out now, but we did it in the 60s, and this plan was so mainstream, it passed the U.S. House of Representatives twice in 1971. Richard Nixon uh, was for it, called the Family Assistance Plan. Martin Luther King was for it. Milton Friedman, a thousand economists, endorsed it. So what they did is they started piloting it by distributing money in various uh, towns throughout the country, and that to me would be the logical place to but start. But you understand, or so you're going to start in towns, you understand the very whiplash nature of our economy today. We go back to 2007, we look at the current indicators, the job report for the first time, we've seen a reduction in manufacturing. I know you have a view on that. Yeah. But how would you deal with, because you turn on the spigot for $1,000 for everybody, but if we're in a 2007 situation, which could happen again, what would be your immediate emergency steps and your intermediate steps, which the Obama administration had to undertake? Well, in the financial crisis, the Obama administration, and you can't begrudge them any decision they made because it was an emergency, it was a crisis, you just have to do whatever you can to pull us back from the brink. But they had a fundamental choice. The choice was either recapitalize the banks right. or forgive the mortgage debt of people. Uh, and they chose to recap the banks. Uh, they printed $4 trillion for the banks, and many, many Americans lost their homes. And so if we were in a situation like that, to me, you should distribute those approaches much more evenly. Uh, and there can't, it cannot be that if an individual American ends up falling through the cracks and it's their fault, but if a large institution uh, is on the verge of failure, then you know, we, we act like we have unlimited resources which is essentially what we did in the financial crisis. So, so would you do that again if you were to face, let's say, you are now in the general election, you win in 2020, as has happened when we switch from one administration to another, there is some sort of cataclysmic something. What if it is a wow. repeat of that? Well, uh, if faced with the same set of decisions, I would put resources directly into the hands of the American people because that money would get spent. Uh, right now, 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Almost half can't afford an unexpected $400 bill. So if you give them some money, they're going to end up spending it in their local communities, at their Main Street businesses, on daycare, uh, home repairs, Little League signups, and things that will help make their communities stronger. Uh, what we did is we pushed $4 trillion into the banks, and we ended up with these mega bubbles in certainly stock market prices, private company valuations, some coastal real estate. The average American in the interior of the country did not experience uh, the gains in the same way that, frankly, people like many of us here in this room did. So your, 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 UBI, your UBI proposal says uh, people will start getting $1,000 a month at 18 years of age, right? Yeah, that's right. As the father of a six-year-old, I want to know why my six-year-old, meaning me, will also not get $1,000 per month, because <laughs> he's expensive. Well, I, I've got a six-year-old and a four-year-old, so I feel your pain. <laughs> uh, and a, a lot of it is that uh, you want to have uh, the individual citizen receive the money in a way that they actually have some autonomy and agency. And I want you to imagine, Viet, because I'm looking forward to this day, where you can look at your son. Mm -hmm. Now, you can look at your son and say, when you turn 18, you're going to get $1,000 a month from your country because your country loves you, your country values you, and you're an American. 
and you're going to take a financial literacy class in high school, and it will actually matter to you because you'll get some money. And right now, if you're anything like me, a lot of what stresses you out is trying to save for your son's future. So the fact that that's waiting for him when he becomes an adult is a game changer, uh, for, and it would be a game changer for parents everywhere. Okay. Um, you're saying for all Americans, right? So where does that start? Do, do residents who are not citizens get the UBI? Do new immigrants who have just arrived in this country get UBI? And what about undocumented immigrants as well? I'm obviously the son of immigrants myself. I know that immigrants are extraordinarily positive in terms of both their economic and social impact. The freedom dividend that I'm proposing would be for citizens. And so if you're a permanent resident or green card holder, this would be an incentive for you to become a citizen. For people who are here and undocumented, I'm for a uh, path to citizenship for people who are here and undocumented. Right now, our, our situation right now is essentially the worst of all worlds, where we have 11 million plus undocumented immigrants in this country, and they're in this gray zone uh, where we don't know who everyone is. They're, they are paying taxes in many cases, but they don't have a path forward. And unfortunately, even when they have kids now, their kids are not being treated in some cases uh, with the uh, privileges of citizenship. So I think we need to create a long-term path. And this would be an enormous incentive for people to want to pursue that path and then ultimately become citizens and start receiving a dividend. When you first told your wife that you are running for president, she said, she asked a very important question. What are you going to do about our health care? Yeah, that was a question. <laughs> um, which I think she echoed a lot of people's concerns, everyday concerns. It is an issue, one of the issues, I think, that really affects you day to day. Um, especially, I don't know, uh, just personally, having been in and out of the hospital, or have had friends or family that have been in and out of the hospital. It's a day to day issue. So how do you hope? to make changes that will directly impact people? Well, I think our healthcare system is in many ways emblematic of what's going on in the rest of the country, where we have a very market-driven system, and we're spending twice as much on our healthcare as other developed countries even to worse results by the numbers. I'm a numbers person, and so I just try and figure out uh, what the, the actual uh, costs are. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's clear that we need to create a public option in the healthcare market that then enables us to negotiate for lower prices and higher levels of access. I, I have a lot of doctor friends. <laughs> I was going to make an Asian joke there. Uh, <laughs> well, they, but they tell me they spend a lot of their time on three things, paperwork, navigating insurance companies, and avoiding being sued. Uh, and that if you could get those three things to be a much lower part of their time, then they could have more time to spend with patients uh, and our care would improve. So a lot of this is around trying to ease up this incredible bureaucracy we've set up around healthcare with this maze of private insurance companies. When we get sick or injured, we're almost more stressed out about navigating the bureaucracy than we are dealing with the injury or sickness, am I right? And there's no reason for that to be the case. My parents are back in Taiwan, and they, it blew their minds the first time they actually started using the healthcare system there. Anyone else have this experience? They were like, they couldn't believe it. They were, they were like, it was like fast, seamless, inexpensive, uh, and the rest of it. And then we come, and then they come back to the U.S. And they used to think that the U.S. would be where they'd want to actually uh, utilize the healthcare system, but now they're they're having a change of heart. Mm -hmm. Who should dictate prices? Well, the uh, the problem right now is the government's not even trying to negotiate lower prices in many, many instances. And so uh, if you had a public option, then you could negotiate prices on behalf of the American people. Uh, the, it would be the government. The government should, not the market. Mm -hmm. Well, but, I, but I'm not someone that's trying to get rid of private insurance. Um, and so it, in many ways, the goal is that you have a public option that can outcompete the marketplace. And so if the public option can demonstrably improve upon what's available in the marketplace, then what does that do? That actually introduces competitive pressures so that, have you all noticed that your healthcare insurance costs always just go in one direction? Have you, do you remember getting that bill and being like, oh, it went down 15%? That has never happened. Yeah. And so that's their revenue model. Their revenue model is we're just gonna ratchet up the costs every year. So if there was a public option that actually helped keep costs in check, then you'd start seeing uh, some more uh, competitive pressures in, in the marketplace. 
and you're not alone in this platform uh, for Medicare for All or for your health care plan. How is yours different from, let's say, other candidates who are also uh, vying for essentially the same thing, but how is your way to get there a little bit different? Uh, so my plan is very similar to, to Pete Buttigieg's and some of the other uh, candidates that are not quite in the single-payer Medicare for All Get Rid of Private Insurance camp, which I believe is Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and maybe one other. Uh, so uh, I think that you need a public option, but you need to try and outcompete private insurers. I think there are maybe half a dozen candidates who have similar plans. Mm -hmm. Your President Yang, uh, Hurricane Dorian comes up the East Coast. How do you handle that national emergency? Well, I, I keep my Sharpies in my desk, for one thing. <laughs> So, <laughs> right now, FEMA is part of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which to me is not the right way to go because literally they diverted funds from FEMA to uh, ICE recently. Uh, and if anything, you have to have FEMA be standalone so it has its own uh, resources and priorities, and then you need to, to make sure it has the resources it needs independently because we know with climate change that these hurricanes and storms and floods and, and disasters will be much more commonplace. So uh, number one is you separate FEMA into its own uh, agency, uh, which it is. It's already its own agency, but it's part of Homeland Security, uh, the umbrella. So you change that. Uh, and then the big thing that we have to do is try and make our communities more resilient before the Hurricane Dorian's strike. Um, this country has become far too reactive, where essentially we have to wait until something breaks or goes dramatically wrong, and then everyone yells about it, and then you go in, and it's much more expensive. Mm -hmm. There have been some situations where we've, we've literally repaired the same home dozens of times, uh, which I would suggest probably is not the most efficient way to go. So we need to try and uh, get in front of these disasters, but certainly when Dorian strikes, uh, we need to have the resources in place but, and an agency that's but, focused but, but on but it. But President Yang, I, I want to understand here your ability to handle crisis management. What will you do on that on those days? You mean would I personally decide to uh, play weatherman and like fly? Into I, I, the I don't know if you want to do that, things? but you, you get my question, right? <laughs> well, if that is the question, you know, to, to me. Um, uh, if I thought that my presence were helpful and not disruptive, then I'd 100 percent go uh, to where the storm was hitting. Though I, I think in many cases, frankly, that becomes a little bit more of a media narrative than genuinely helpful to the people on the ground. On the question of uh, climate change and <laughs> on the question of climate change and natural disaster, I think you've already said once that um, with the climate change that's already in motion, there are certain things we can't stop. There's going to be a certain level of sea rise, for yes. example. Okay. So thank you for the realism. It's also a little bit depressing. But um, given that you've already talked about that we have to be proactive, take certain kinds of measures, that there's going to be a certain level of, of sea level rise, and we're dealing with an AAPI community that includes Pacific Islanders in places like Hawaii, Guam, American Samoa, where they yeah. may not be very happy to hear that you've simply written them off. What then, if in fact we are going to confront sea level rise, how are you as a president going to address these communities that are going to be affected by this. Uh, how many of you all saw the uh, last debate in Detroit? Um, so if you remember, I, I staked out the new third position on climate change. Uh, position one is we have to fight climate change. Position number two is climate change is a hoax. And then the new third position is it's worse than you think. And uh, we need to take dramatic action, not just to reduce the bad, but also try and increase the good. So I am the opposite of the person that thinks we should write off uh, people in Guam or Puerto Rico, we have to do much, much more and own up to the fact that our climate is changing irreversibly and that sea level rise is unfortunately going to be with us even if the United States were to dramatically change its ways. The United States only accounts for 15 percent of global emissions. So even if we were somehow to go miraculously to zero in 12 years, the earth would likely still continue to warm. So I just came out with a five-point plan that includes moving towards renewable sources of energy, exporting those technologies to other parts of the world, because right now Africa is taking power plants from China that burn coal. And they're excited about it because they just need energy. They don't really care about what's going on uh, in terms of climate change. So we need to try and change their incentives. We need to reverse some of the damage we're doing 
by reforesting tracts of land, by trying to reseed parts of the ocean with plankton and other things that will resuscitate those ecosystems. But the fourth big thing to your point, Viet, is we need to move our people to higher ground, both literally and figuratively, which, makes, which means investing in the infrastructure of these communities. But in some cases, it may mean, and, and if you think I'm being overly dramatic, we have already relocated climate refugees in Louisiana that were in a part of the state that became uninhabitable, and then we moved them. So if you think that that's not where we are, we're there now. And we need to be doing more of those things rather than letting our people, frankly, get, uh, get swept out to sea. Uh, Andrew, you talked about, um, or you identified yourself kind of with uh, Barack Obama, Jimmy Carter, saying they came out of nowhere. There seems to be, and apologies, I'm butchering it, but sort of like a model to that. Um, I feel like there's a lot of uh, press talk about the negatives of being an outsider. No one knew who you were. Um, but what are kind of the advantages to it? What are the benefits that you are seeing after being on the campaign trail for so long? Right now, the number one criteria that Democrats have for the nominee is who can beat Donald Trump. That's one reason why Joe Biden's number one, because he th people think that he's the uh, most electable. But if you dig into polling of Trump supporters, I am one of only two candidates that 10% or more of Trump voters said that they would support, which means if I'm the Democratic nominee, the Democrats will win this election. That's just math. And, I, and one of the reasons why I'm getting double-digit support from Trump voters is because I'm not a politician, I'm new, uh, I'm from outside the system. Uh, when Donald Trump ran around saying, drain the swamp, there are a lot of Americans who've lost faith in our government, particularly our government in D.C., to solve the problems that they're experiencing in their lives. And so when I'm campaigning in places like New Hampshire and Iowa, a lot of people will say to me, you don't sound like a politician, and I like that. Uh, it, unfortunately, we're at a point now where it's going to take some combination of politicians and non-politicians to solve the problems. Mm -hmm. And I feel like... Your presence, if we go back to uh, the hypothetical situation, President Yang, I feel like there, you can't help but have talk about your role in talking about race. I feel like your presence itself, there has to be some things that are addressed uh, with the relationship with Asia, yeah. et cetera. Um, how do you plan to kind of address those changes because much has already been changed? Well, we joke around the office what Donald Trump's nickname for me will be. And, uh, we were just talking about that, yes. too. What might that be? We've come up with Comrade Yang. Comrade Yang. Uh. <laughs> it's it's a, a little racist, little socialist. <laughs> uh, but I think that under my administration, uh, you know, right now the rest of the world is looking at us being like, what the heck is going on in the United States of America? Uh, and the opposite of Donald Trump, in many respects, is an Asian man who likes math. <laughs> so after I win in 2020, can you imagine the rest of the world? They'd be like, wow, they turned that around really quickly. <laughs> and, and after my victory, the celebrations will extend beyond the United States of America. There are going to be some many happy people in other parts of the world, too. And I think at that point, we can actually start rebuilding uh, globally, our global relationships. Well, give us one example of that. Obviously, uh, you know, President Obama got a lot of flack from a certain corner of this country for supposedly not being American. I don't think this country has changed so much that if you become president, you're going to face any kind of a different situation. Some people out there will question who you are, what your allegiances are, and so on. And yeah. of course, questions of China, Taiwan are going to be still important as they are today. How, how are you going to confront that situation, both in terms of some people's perceptions of you, but also confronting or dealing with China and Taiwan? Well, that's one of the joys of this campaign. And it, it gave me a lot of pride to know that millions of Americans turn on, they're going to turn on ABC this Thursday, see me on the debate stage in Houston. And, and, and I like to believe that just having someone who looks like me on that stage is going to help transform what they think of as Asian Americans' place in this country. Uh, and that's something that made me very happy. 
It's going to make me even happier after I win. Yeah. And him. You're going to make him very <laughs> happy. I know. Uh, but uh, the fact that I'm laser focused on solving the problems that the American people see in their communities. When I campaign in Iowa or New Hampshire, frankly, places that don't have that many uh, Asian Americans, um, the reaction that I'm getting is generally very positive, even based upon my own identity. Because I, I do a lot of talking about numbers and technology, and then people are like, well, it seems like he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that always works. Throw out a number, right? I've, I've done it as well. Uh, so <laughs> Fake it till you make it. They get all dizzy. Um, since we are talking about race, and we saw one of the contenders not do so well, at least in appearance. And it's the mayor uh, of, a, of a very moderate town, shall we say, in South Bend, Indiana. And he did, Pete Buttigieg did not handle the situation with law enforcement as well as the African-American community. So I'm very interested, Andrew, what would your first speech be on race? And how would you address the issue of seeing African Americans, one group of Americans that at a rate of incarceration, and we're talking about criminal justice here, yeah. there seems to be, at least by the data, a problem yet an opportunity to fix something. Well, what I, I, I speak to African American groups uh, fairly frequently on the campaign, and what I tell them is, I say flat out, it's like, look, I know what it's like to grow up uh, and not be white in this country, but I have no idea what it's like to grow up and be black in this country, because that's a whole other set of experiences. And, and what I say to them is like, I think I know what it's like to have words used against you, but you all have numbers working against you. And in my experience, numbers are much more cruel and harsh. And the numbers are going to get even worse for African Americans in the years to come. A study just came out that said, median African American household net worth will be zero in 2053. And you ask, well, why is it going to go to zero? It's going to go to zero because if you think about the technologies that are coming online, it's going to get rid of retail workers and truck drivers and clerical workers, and the first people that are going to get pushed out of the workforce are going to be people of color, people with lower levels of education, people with lower levels of uh, capital and resources. And so what I say to black communities, like, look, these inequities are actually not going to get any better. They're just going to get worse. And the only way to make it right for you is to do what Dr. Martin Luther King said in the 60s, which is just to have... Uh, guaranteed minimum income, which is another name for the freedom dividend, because then you would be able to reconstitute many of their communities and give uh, the kids a much better chance to learn. One reason why we're not making progress in education the way we'd like is that 65 to 70 percent of school children's academic performance is based upon non-school factors. Things like words read to them when they're young, household income, stress levels in the house, type of neighborhood, all these things that schools can't really control. And so if you're an educator, you feel like you're being held accountable for 100% of kids' performance, and you can only control a third. And, you know, people in our community, I think, frankly, kind of sense this, because, like, our, our parents are, like, focused on us. I don't know, but, like, the summer, it's like, you don't get summers off. <laughs> you know, it's like time to find something else to learn. And, and so, uh, so if we're going to make things right for... Uh, black people in this country are going to have to go much, much deeper, which includes trying to reconstitute the level of resources in the home. Well, one of the more divisive racial issues that... <laughs> one of the more divisive racial issues that Asian Americans and African Americans are caught up in is affirmative action. Now, uh, the polling data shows that the majority of Asian Americans support affirmative action, but that's not true across the board. For example, Chinese Americans tend to be split on this issue. It's not necessarily an issue that can be addressed, I don't think, purely by universal basic income. So what's your stance on affirmative action? How would you address uh, some of the debates and controversies that are going on around it right now? Uh, I'm pro-affirmative action, and I resent how Asian Americans are often used as a lever. Uh, because if you look at the people who are bringing these lawsuits, it's often conservative groups that, uh, frankly, I, in my opinion, like, do not care that much about the Asian American community's interests. They're just trying to uh, do away with policies that, that they don't like. Uh, I think affirmative action is, by and large, a uh, positive thing. Can it be tweaked and modified in some context, in some regards? Yes, but uh, doing away with it would be would lead to a very, very uh, stratified educational system in many, many environments. Okay. I'm also a university professor, and on a related. Oh, what do you teach? What do I teach? I teach English. If you want to go That's against right. stereotypes, okay. <laughs> um. Wait, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> 
No, I'm just saying, you know, Asian American parents out there, please encourage your children to become English majors. We tell stories. We need stories to change the American landscape. Um, so along with rising health care costs, one of the other really expensive parts of American life is higher education. Yes. You know, USC, God, I love it, but it's $57,000 a year to go there, $20,000 a year on top of that for, for, uh, for expenses. So how do we get that under control? I assume you think this is too expensive. You know, how yes. do we get this? Under I have kids, man. Don't yeah. worry. I'm looking out for us. <laughs> yeah. How do we get it? How do we get What is the problem? <laughs> how do we get it under control in terms of spiraling higher education costs? Oh, and I go to people. I ask, why did college get two and a half times more expensive when it, it did not get two and a half times better? And there are, are two main reasons. Number one is that in many contexts, states stopped supporting their university systems to the same degree, as happened with, uh, with the UC system and others. But the other huge, bigger driver is administrative bloat, where universities have hired 200% uh, more administrators than, than professors, mm -hmm. uh, where at this point you have just layers and layers of bureaucracy. Uh, and I've run a national nonprofit, so I get it. When you run a nonprofit organization, you hire more people that are like you. So if you're a nonprofit administrator, you're like, oh, my, you know, I can hire another administrator. And then you end up, over time, it becomes an effective tax on the American people because you feel like you have no choice but to pay. And then the government comes along and says, what? You need $60,000 a year? We'll give you loans for that. And so you wind up with $1.5 trillion in student loan debt, which is what we're up to now. It's very analogous in many ways to the mortgage, uh, the mortgage bubble. So you have to attack this at every level. You have to try and put more public resources to work. The big thing I would do is I would tie uh, grant funding and even your tax-exempt status to the ratio of administrators to students in universities. Uh, and then that would force universities to have to, they, they would say there's no way we can do this work with fewer administrators than we have. And then you'd say, well, I have a feeling you'll figure it out um, if, uh, if your money's at stake. And then they would figure it out. And you would find that in many cases it would have very little impact on the student experience. Maybe one last thing on higher education. What, 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 we've we, we got eight minutes. I want to make sure that Esther okay. gets to go out in the audience with Andrew because there's a couple people out here that probably want to see this guy and talk to him, right? Yeah, I want to. But before you do that, I've got to ask this question about gender inequality. How do you fix it? I'm very interested in your thought here. We have a lot of issues right now. We're in Southern California. It's a topic that we've seen throughout the, the last election and now. Lots of topics. You pick it. So I come from the entrepreneurship world, and I've seen just how stark the inequities are between men and women in that environment, where if you're a woman, raise your hands if you're an entrepreneur, period, in this room, because um, I'm sure there are many, many entrepreneurs here. So I've seen women entrepreneurs in particular uh, that not only do they have more barriers where in terms of access to capital in their own household uh, before they even go out into the marketplace, but then when they go out into the marketplace, investors, mentors, uh, customers, partners, everything is an uphill climb. Something like 95% of angel investors are men, as one example. Uh, and so if you want to try, and, and Katie Calvoto is here is uh, you know, an awesome role model. Uh, for female entrepreneurs, but like we have to do much more to try and make it more possible for women to lead and run their own organizations. Uh, and that, that's something I'm very passionate about because like, I, I, I did that work for seven years and I saw just how ridiculously uh, stacked against women entrepreneurs uh, the, the startup world is. Esther, Andrew, head out to the audience yes. really quickly. Well, I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions uh, today. Uh, we're going to kind of head in and see if any of you guys have a question. If you we'll might, love that. don't mind joining me. Andrew hates this stuff. <laughs> he hates it. <laughs> also, um, shout out to my friend Dave Min. Where's Dave Min at? Oh, Let's man. get Dave Min into office. <laughs> okay. um, so we're actually going to go down. Anyone here want to talk to Andrew today? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Beautiful young woman over here. Oh. Oh, okay. It is her first presidential election, and she has very vocally said that she would like to meet you. Very briefly, what is your name and where are you from? Uh, my name is Shweta Ashokraj. I am from the Bay Area, but I'm from from Chennai, India. <laughs> Great. And I'm going to stop you right there and bring you guys to the I think you just coined from from. <laughs> I've gotten that a lot, actually. 
All right. from white people. <laughs> Take it away. Um, so I'm a sophomore diplomacy and world affairs economics double major at Occidental College here in Pasadena. Woo! Um, first, I want to say it's an honor and a privilege to be here and to meet you. I'm going to say that again because it is a privilege to be here. Um, my question is regarding a subject that's really triggering and I don't want it to be taken lightly. So I hope that this is a space in which I am respected um, and validated for the experiences I'm about to talk about. And I just want to put a trigger warning out there for survivors. Um, there's no other way to preface this. So just two weeks ago, I was raped. I didn't give consent. I refused twice. And I was still raped. I am now one in every six women that have been raped. I'm a part of the 54% of women aged 18 to 34, voters, by the way, that are victims of sexual assault. It, this doesn't just happen to women, but trans and LGBTQ members as well. Even last night, an event labeled to provide a safe space for Asian Americans was filled with old men, both Asian and white, drunkenly making passes at me and my friends sitting right here, who are also the same age as me, 19. Mind you, we are barely legal. We are forced to take safety precautions instead of holding these men accountable. I have to protect my drink, make sure my body is covered, go to the bathroom with a buddy, carry a sharp object, and I could go on, but I don't wanna waste your time either. But you know what? I know I'm beautiful, I know I'm smart, and I wanna look good, and I should be comfortable and empowered when I do so. And I didn't say that for applause. Like, I, even my friends are out here, they look amazing. And I shouldn't feel like I need to suppress myself because a man couldn't control his penis. And I really need you to take me seriously because I'm not just your constituent. I hope to be your successor. So my question is, what are you gonna do to protect me and the 90% of women and LGBTQ members that experience sexual assault or rape at least once in their lifetime? Thank you. Um, can I touch you? Yes. Can I touch you? Can I, can I give you a hug? Yes. Oh, Thank I'm so you. sorry. It's okay. It happens. I'm so but sorry. it's not normal. Oh, it's, uh, there are people in my life who've had similar experiences. Uh, that's true of all of us, whether we know it or not. I mean, it's a scourge that uh, pervades our society. And there are things that we can do. The, the deeper you go, the more ugly the reality gets. Uh, where, so one rule that I'm going to be championing uh, is, and, and th this is, like, I want to talk about the rules, because this is what, if you ask a politician this question, then I'll say, here are the rules, and here are the rules that we can do better. Um, and I have a whole set of rules that we need to have that do better. But then, to me, there's, like, the, the, the stuff that just goes on in people's hearts and souls and, and minds. Uh, and that, to me, is the more important, uh, in a way. So I have a whole set of rules I can talk about, like, institutions that cover up sexual assault and sexual predators, like, have... That like the the rules around that right now, many institutions have an incentive where if someone in their midst uh, is a sexual uh, offender of some way, then they get concerned about their liabilities and they brush it under the rug, and then they just try and keep it quiet. Uh, and what that does, there are other people that, in all likelihood, have been impacted by that offender that might think they're the only one, or that like they're blaming themselves in some way, and that uh, in rare cases, an institution will actually come forward and say, "Hey, this person." Uh, is uh, now like a convicted sexual offender. And so, you know, if there is someone else who had this experience, let us know. But most institutions do not do that because they don't want to obviously go near that. So I'm championing a rule that says, look, if you employ a, a convicted sexual offender, you have to actually publicize to like the world and also the people that have interacted with that person that this person's now. And yeah, and it happens at, at USC. So that, because what happens in many cases that the offenders are part of institutions that end up de facto protecting them um, because they think that's in their interests. And so you have to make it so it's not in their interest to protect. Um, so that's a rule that I'm championing. Uh, the the non-rule stuff is, is to me as or more important where to me, uh, strong men treat women well, weak men do not. And so the fundamental question in this context is how do you make boys and men stronger so that when they see a beautiful woman, they know that they can express their interest in a way that's non, like, uh, you know, non-oppressive, but it can do, and then if they get rejected, then they can actually take that in the right way. That to me is like a challenge that needs to be undertaken. But th this country right now is essentially experiencing uh, this 
kind of struggle of masculinity on multiple dimensions. Well, we're all concerned about the mass shootings. We all know 98% plus of the shooters are boys and men. And so, so you have, and, and yeah, most of them, well, most, most of them are, are uh, like, are white. And so, so we're seeing that this larger set of issues, to me, is actually one of the great crises in American life right now. Uh, and it's playing out in our politics, where one of the reasons why I'm running for president right now is that you see this population that's struggling to come to terms with what the future holds. And right now, it's turning around and blaming various scapegoats, like immigrants, and the fund and minorities. Yes. <laughs> that what we have to do is we have to turn the spotlight on things that we can actually address collectively. And one of the things that is driving it is this mindset of scarcity that is sweeping many, many communities. Uh, and that's what, to me, like, uh, you all may know me as, like, the person who wants to give everyone $1,000 like, uh, a month. A lot of that's about reducing stress, improving mental health, improving education levels, decreasing domestic violence, decreasing mm -hmm. hospital visits. Uh, and then we can start to address the, the crisis of masculinity that then touches the, the issues that you so bravely brought up today and some of the other uh, fundamental issues in our society. But and I just want to thank you for, mm -hmm. for sharing your experience with us. And please know that you have an, a friend and ally in me, because I, I, I know how. And I know you will. I know you will. Do amazing things. She is going to be my successor. We can all feel it. I can't. Okay. I wasn't born here. Thank you. Uh, you can become governor of California. <laughs> there we go, governor of California. Um, it is obvious that there's a lot of uh, deep-rooted issues with this, but we do want to give um, Andrew some time to address uh, you guys and give a statement. So if you'll join me back on stage. Um, Thank you again. Hello, thank you so much. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to address you. Uh, I'm running for president to try and solve, to me, the problems that are tearing our country apart. So in 2016, Donald Trump said, we're going to make America great again. And he presented a, a set of solutions that were not the right ones. What were they? Well, first, what was Hillary Re Clinton's response to make America great again? America's already great. And that did not work in 2016. So his solutions were, we're going to build a wall, we're going to turn the clock back, we're going to bring the old jobs back. And I've spoken to thousands of Trump supporters around the country. Most of them didn't even really believe that those things were going to happen. Like, if you actually sit with them and say, like, hey, did you think you were, were going to get the jobs back? They would say, it's like, well, I thought we would, you know, uh, try and do things in that direction. But even if I didn't get my job back, uh, I still respect Trump for calling out the problems. I'm getting Trump voters in part because I'm calling out the same problems, but I have a different set of solutions. Instead of turning the clock back, we have to turn the clock forward. We have to advance our society and evolve in how we think about work and value. I talk sometimes about my wife who's at home with our two boys, one of whom has autism, and right now her work is calculated at zero in the modern economy. The way we beat Donald Trump is by redefining the modern economy to include all sorts of work so that people who are losing their jobs in the middle of the country still feel like they have a place in this country. Now, Asian Americans have a unique opportunity in 2020. Our community, let's face facts, our community does not donate or vote or run for office at the same levels as other groups. And because of that, the danger is that we become an afterthought. But this race is going to be an historic opportunity because California, although there are a few reasons. One, I'm running for president as the first Asian American uh, man to do so as a Democrat. But two, California moved up its uh, primary voting schedule. How many of you knew that? Your mail-in votes will take place at the same time as Iowa for the first time. Ordinarily, by the time it, it gets to you all, the, the nominations well underway and you don't feel like you have a crucial voice. This time, thanks to your leaders, California can actually make its presence felt 
And this time, the Asian American community here in California can become a crucial difference maker in this race. So I say we take advantage of the opportunity that history has provided and show them that we are just as American as everyone else in 2020. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Thanks, guys.